Okay. This is this is a, a little uh, opening session on drivetrain basics. And, uh, I just want to give you guys a heads up on some of this stuff. It doesn't really take all that long to go through this. But uh, what you're going to do with a transmission? If you got how many how many foot pounds of torque does an engine have generally? You got any idea? Yeah. What do you say? Two thousand. Well, no, I don't have that much. Usually, you'll have like uh, you know, like two hundred to four hundred. I think one fifty-two. I mean, this is like I mean, like you know, some of your power stroke diesels have five, six hundred foot pounds of torque, and, uh, and all that. And uh, let's see what you got to say here. All right, talk to me, Donnie. What'd you find? I just wanted you to know that I did have to drive them in, and I uh, was able to drive them in. And then I needed a slap hammer to pull them back out. Ah, okay. So that's, that's what it was if you run into it, you know. We're accustomed to like pulling that shaft and then pushing them in and and that's all there is to do. Yep. And you had but, to knock uh, them in with a hammer. I was, I was thinking it's something like that since she's replacing the bearings. I had hit them already lightly mm -hmm. with a uh, smallish plastic hammer. Yeah. Oh, well, that was second-rate amateur. You should hit him with a sludge. <laughs> um, well, the thing was, I, there's a lot of things I had to wrap my head around. There is a block there in the, in the middle mm -hmm. that, um, that is just a, a metal block thing that you uh, it can get out of place and, and keep you from pushing in some. Okay. But if you, but I had enough movement to pilot, you know, get that thing just right and pilot into it. Mm -hmm. And then drove it in. All right. Well, let me get on. Let me get on with this class I'm teaching. I'll be. I'll be back with you. See you, bye now. He was working on a on the one that you guys are having to do, where you have to take the axles, push them in, let the C clips fall off. He's working on a late model Chevrolet, and it's positive traction. And he was trying to push the, the bearings on the outside were shot. And he's trying to push the axles in, and he could only about half expose the C clip. It wouldn't go in. And he was trying to figure out if he was missing something or whatever. And I said, you know, get a, you know, get a big hammer and hit the axle, and knock it in. Anyway, if you're replacing the bearing, and it may be foul out there or something. And when he did that, his C clips dropped out. Y'all know what I'm talking about when you pull the grill out. Yo, we did it on your Mazda yeah, last know. semester. You remember that? Mm -hmm. thing actually, anyway, uh, but you got, you got, you got between usually on a normal car, you know, two, four hundred pounds of torque. But you got a three thousand pound car, so you're going to have to have a lot more oomph than that. So you got to run it through the gears in the transmission to get enough back to the rear end to go. All right, it's got to provide a means of increasing or decreasing power to meet vehicle operating positions. Basically, you're wanting more power and less speed whenever you're taking off or when you're getting ready to pull a trailer off or something like that. Then it's just, well, the, the more you go down the road, you, if, it, the, if you can have the engine turning pretty slow and you're going at highway speeds, you're not burning a lot of gas. That's what overdrive is all about. The drive shaft's turning faster than the engine in overdrive. Okay, yeah, you remember on your 10-speed uh, bicycle, you rode one of those? Remember that 10-speed bicycle? All right, what is it when you, when you got it in the lowest gear, your pedals are just going to town, and you're barely moving, but you can pull a haul, or you can pull a long heel really easy, right? That's what this whole thing about. Chain transmits the power produced by the pedaling of the rear wheel. The sprockets provide a means of increasing distribution of power. And so basically, you got your engine, you got your transmission, you got your rear axle assembly, differentials in there. It's basically taking what's going in and running it out this way. And you've got high point gears, means basically that the gear coming in from the drive shaft is above or below the center line of the ring gear. Basically, all that means years ago they used to use just spur gears for that, and they were kind of noisy and they weren't that strong and all that. Uh, but the term transmission refers to a rear wheel drive vehicle using a rear axle mounted differential. So, we had this, y'all, some of y'all seen this picture out here before. A transaxle means it's all made together. The differential is not separated from the transmission, it's all in the same unit. That's what that is. And so, basically, you got different gear ratios, keeps the engine operated at its ideal RPM range at so many vehicle speeds. Because you know what? The, the power curve on an engine is basically going to be, most engines, 3,600 RPM. If you look at a dyno, it's going to go up, you know, and I'm talking about just standard oil, I talk race cars, all that stuff. So you're basically wanting to keep it in that power range, you know, where you'll have it at its most uh, efficient. So when it's standing still, you got to have a lot of power to take off, but whenever you're already going, you got that momentum working for you, and if you move at a steady speed, it takes a lot less power. There you go. Now, basically, overdrive is your highest gear. Now, sometimes if you don't want it going into overdrive, which is basically a super high gear because you're pulling a trailer or something like that, you push the tow haul button. Now, on my wife's pickup truck, you push the button once for tow haul and you push it twice for sport. 
So if you push it twice, you get firmer shifts and all that. <laughs> so it's basically like, you know, for years they actually, on electronic transmissions, they'd have a little switch on the dash or on the shifter that would say sport. You know, they give you a nice, you know, firm mark shift. They also had on some of the transmissions they call fuzzy logic. If you were using a cruise control, it would hold the gears a little longer going up a hill instead of downshifting on some of your Chrysler stuff, you know, you know Mitsubishi stuff. Maybe. The differential transmits torque from the transmission to each driving wheel using connected gears. Now these right here are your spider gears in here. This right here is the ring gear. You can see the uh, pinion gear back there. And of course you got bearings in here. And whenever you, see this in here is just a differential that's got the axles out of it. So you don't see the this plan in axle. That's a differential final drive combination right there. Uh, and so the gears are necessary because the drive wheel's got to rotate at different speeds every time the vehicle turns. If you get one of these little bitty radio control cars and you take the rear end apart on it, it's got little spider gears in there because when you're turning, the outside wheel needs to be able to turn faster than the inside one because so it's making a bigger circle. Okay, so the rear wheel drive components, which you got right here, you got your drive shaft, universal joints. Uh, you know, some of these things will even have uh, constant velocity on joints right here. And the difference between a universal joint and a constant velocity joint, if you ever took a wiggler, like a, like a wiggler, you put it on a socket, and you bend it too sharp, what happens? It's going, ew, 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 you know what I'm saying? But if you get an impact wiggler that's got that little ball, no matter how far you bend it to its maximum, it's still pulling the same way. You know, and so the reason they call it constant velocity is because if you bend a constant velocity joint, it's actually not going to slow down and speed up like one that's just a crossed up, you know, cross U-joint. And uh, that's basically what that's about. The ring gear and the pinion gears take the power from the transmission and turn it 90 degrees going out the wheels. Front wheel drive vehicles have the differential adjacent to the engine. That's kind of how they're set up. Now you got your CV axles out here. Uh, instead of a single drive shaft, you use two half shafts, one for each front wheel, and each end of the half shafts a constant velocity joint. And that's what they look like. You have just about all seen those. When you look under there and you see the boots are busted on these, it's a whole lot better to just go ahead and get a $65 transaxle, I mean a CV axle pop in there. You can get the boots and you can take those apart and you can clean them, you can pack them with grease and you can put them back in there, but it's aggravating, it takes a long time, the labor's, you know, going to be more. So the, you know, the CV axles, you know, usually they'll have a core, sometimes they're brand new and all that. Most all of you guys have seen a CV axle. And uh, this right here, incidentally, is a, uh, a half shot, I mean a CV axle out of a 2012 uh, Toyota Camry and it wears out and these little little dimples down in here whenever you're turning those uh, balls are rolling in and out of those little dimples that are worn in there and it goes click 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 you might have heard that when you're turning sharp you know that typically means you got that this one clicks at a higher rate than a regular one because it's got eight instead of six which will fool you if you're used to listening to the six tick 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 you got two extra clicks in there on this one and it'll say I don't know if that's a CV axle or not it sounds like it's the wrong frequency you know? okay so your rear axle basics, you got your 90 degree change in rotation, like I said before. Okay, and here's your rear axle, rear suspension and brake components. Uh, knowing your gear ratio is pretty important. How many times the drive shaft turns to how, compared to how many times the wheels turn. Uh, I had a Ford pickup one time that I bought uh, in 1978 for $2,000. It was a 74 model pickup truck. And this pickup truck uh, was getting seven miles to the gallon. And to give you an idea of when I bought it, the first time I pulled up to the gas pump, it was bone dry empty, and I filled it up with gas for $6. And I thought I was going to croak because I had been used to paying $3 on my other car, which was a small car. And I said, how am I going to be able to afford to pay $6 every time I gas up my truck? Well, actually, trying to get the gas mileage up, I put a different rear, I mean, I put a different pumpkin in the rear end, different gears, and I went from 332s to 275 and doubled the gas mileage, and I was really happy with 14 miles per gallon. It was great when I had been given seven, right? Okay, now, late model GM or axle ID numbers are typically stamped right here. Now, there may be some changes in the extreme late models, but basically that's where they work. Uh, now, the Ford ones like to put them on a tag uh, under one of these bolts. And those numbers are important because if you're ordering parts for it from the dealer or wherever, a lot of times they're going to want those numbers. You know, just giving them a make, model, and year, that don't work if they're asking you for specific numbers off the rear end. All right. Now, for rear axle ID numbers, you basically it's got a little tag like that under one of the bolts. Now, don't leave the tag off. Remember, put the tag back on there. You can figure out what the ratio is if you have to, but it's a whole lot better to have all that. This tells you the ring gear, and that tells you the gear ratio, 355, and all that. So, 
if you've got that tag right there, and you can basically give the parts man that information, he the more information you give the parts man, the happier he is with you. And if anybody that's ever worked behind a parts counter will tell you that there's all the time people come in there, you know, like uh, this this guy that I know that works at a parts store said, somebody coming the other day said, I need a fuel pump for a race car. You know, how am I supposed to look that up? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Now then, pinion gear, ring gear. That's ring and pinion, pinion gear set. That's the housing that it comes out of. Now, you guys that are in this course are going to be carrying one of these apart, putting it back together. We'll show you how to use the tools and everything. You need to know how to do that. It's not quite as bad as it seems as far as the complexity of it. It's a little aggravating because you got to have some special tools to get it set up right. Um, one revolution to three point. So you have three seventy three gears right there. If you're turning that three point seven times, you know your ring gears hooked to your wheels. It's going out there. And on most of these right here, the bolts that hold this to that ring gear carrier are going to be left hand thread. So be particular about that. Make sure you look at your book. See what you got on that. Uh, now I'll tell you. One time I was putting a. Uh, I had to put up a, get a used rear axle housing for a Ford uh, 78F350 that we had with the place I worked. And when I, it was just like the other axle housing, but when I put the ring gear and the pinion in it, I couldn't see that the pinion depth is important. There's a little shim you got to do to set that. And then basically the relationship between these two gears, the backlash and all, is going to be set by moving the, this, this gear farther that way or that way, you know, in mesh with this one. And when I pulled that thing together, I could not move this, no matter what shims I used on these bearings over here, I could not get that far away, far enough away from that where that thing would work. It would like lock up when I put it together. So we happened to have a machine shop guy there, and I took the carrier that this bolts to over to the, to the lathe, and I said, chuck this up in your lathe and take 125 thousandths off of it, which is an eighth of an inch. It's good and beefy, you could handle it. When he did that, I was able to put it together and get it working just fine. I don't know what you'd have done if you didn't have a lathe. Uh, if the drive shaft RPM is 800 revolutions per minute, the pinion gear will complete 800 revolutions in one minute. The ring gear will complete 214.5. All right, so here's your gear set. Bevel gear set, straight cut teeth. See that? They're really noisy. Uh, this particular one here is your spiral bevel gear set. Teeth cut on an angle, pinion gear on the center of the ring gear, quieter than a bevel gear set, and resists scoring. Allows for, uh, but see, notice it's still coming in through the middle. All right. Now this one right here is your high point gear set. It's, it's, it'll either be going in above or below. Can you see how the teeth are cut? Slightly different even from that one. That's what you got. The pinion gears offset, quieter than the other gear, sensitive to scoring. Now this one here will sing like a canary if those gears get mismatched. And you cannot look at those gears and tell uh, by looking at the gears. They'll look just as polished and smooth as anything you've ever seen. But when you're driving down the road, they go, ng, 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 and just sing. First time I put, yeah, you know, I figured it was just gears. I, you know, got some, you know, put the gears in there without setting them up like I was supposed to, and I drove the car down the road, and it was just singing up a storm, you know. And uh, I didn't have a clue what I was doing the first time I'd done one. I was way back long time ago, back in the 70s. But uh, you learn stuff like that, you know. All right, there's your differential components. You got these shims right here that where you gonna have, you know, you add a thicker shim here and a thinner shim here, and that moves that. Now, now the preload on those bearings is important too. <coughs> There's supposed to be enough pressure on those bearings where they can't do anything except turn. You don't want to move them back and forth. That's what preload is about. And on this one here, the, the bearing on that one's going to be preloaded too. There's a crush sleeve in there. We'll talk about that more later. And this is your little, see, this is the part I had a machine off of on that story I was telling you earlier. I had a machine off this part right here. And there's the little spider's gears that are broken apart. And basically, it's equal traction driving straight ahead. When you're driving straight ahead, that little thing doesn't do. I have one of these things over here somewhere. And I don't want it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'll get it out a little bit later. I, had it stay, I thought I had it set up here somewhere. Anyway, the point is, these right here just don't do anything except go roll together. They're not even reacting with each other going down the road. But whenever you're throwing it, going to a turn, they begin to react. Here's your little overall procedure. You're going to pull that off. You're going to wash all this out really, really good. See, they got some like 409 on there. But anyway, after you drain it out, you're going to do that. You're going to permit the necessary visual inspection. Look at it and see if you see anything chips, see dirty fluids, see crud in there. Uh, inspect all the parts for wear and damage. Turn the drive shaft by hand. Rotate the gears. Check for any sign of roughness. Uh, you know, I always like to check the backlash at this point, too, and see what it looks like. And some of y'all have already done that. There's your little backlash check. You were always, I showed you this the other day. Y'all are going to be doing that, too. You and you. When you get that transfer case back to that Bronco, you're going to pull the axles out and do all that stuff like we're talking about. The backlash is out of, out of 8 to 12 specified range. You remember what it was when we measured it? We put it, we put it out indicator on there and measured it, remember? 
That's it. You burned two minutes. All right. All right. Now, right here, they're basically talking about, they're going to see if this is working. Now, that don't usually happen, but in extreme circumstances, you know, you look at the run out, which is basically, see, is the gear doing this, you know. And so, basically, got that little bolt right there. Now, I will tell you this. If you're pulling these little bolts out and you're working on one, that's going people are going to be driving. It's better to replace that with a new bolt every time. They don't cost that much. Then you have some in your toolbox, you know, for various ones, because sometimes that little sucker will break. Jonathan Price was driving his Mustang. If somehow another that bolt let go, he hadn't even been working on the rear end. He put a motor in it. But that bolt come out of there, this came out going down the road, and he flipped that thing over, and it went and wound up out there upside down in the middle of a, a grass patch. And then, of course, he climbed out of it and went on, you know. But the fact that he had to get him a different another Mustang, and it was like a 2004 model or something. Uh, but, I mean, we had a pit full of people out there working on it. You remember when you push those in, you pull that off? You remember seeing that? You push those in, you pull them. That's what Donnie was talking about a while ago. He couldn't get this axle far enough in to get them out. And I told him to whack on the end of that axle and knock it on in there and let them drop out of there. All right, remove the retainers. That's what we had to do. Exactly. So uh, the differential gears could be now removed. All right, so you pull the axle out like that. Now, there's a seal we had to replace on your, uh, the model that you drive over there. Okay, and so the bearing caps have always got to be installed in the original position. Remember where these were. Don't just put them back on there either any kind of a way because they're machine special for the side of their own marker caps. Make sure you put them back on. Use whatever you have to. Make a file mark on one of them or, you know, get your stencil and put an R on it or whatever. And so loosen the bearing cap bolts but don't remove them yet. Now, on the one that we got out of our advantage, there's a big old uh, spreader that I got on it because you got to spread it. If you spread it too much, you'll bust the housing, so don't spread it a whole lot. Uh, pry the differential loose inside the loosened caps. Now you don't take that, you, you're doing this up in the vehicle and you don't want to say you fall out land on your foot. So you loosen the caps up and when it pops loose, then you can take the caps loose and get it out there like that. All right, so you grab it like that from the bearing cup and the shim and pull it out of the housing with the shims and bearing. Don't mix the shims of the bearing cups, keep them where they were. There's a shim that goes between here and here, the little round thing and it's made out of cast iron. There's a special driver to knock it back in there. And it's gonna be pretty snug because it's actually providing a preload for a bearing. And you're supposed to check them with a, a you know, inch pound torque wrench to see how what it takes to keep that thing turning. All right, whenever you're gonna pull your drive pinion out, always, you know, it's a good idea. The dealer always says mark that and put it back right where it was so that if you, you know, mark it, make sure that if you put it back in a different place, you may wind up with a vibration that you didn't have to start with. It's a good idea to do that. Uh, always install a spare yoke or a seal installer. What we've done on that one right there, is we get one of our natural gloves and we put it over the back of that uh, transmission extension housing with a, you know, with some tape or tail wrap and all that. that glove kind of fills up with oil, but it keeps oil from just going all over the floor. So the oil's gonna drip out of that thing, you know. Uh, then there's your inch pound torque wrench. You take that inch pound torque wrench and you're basically gonna record how much inch pounds of torque it takes to keep that thing turning. Not how much to get it turning, how much to keep it turning. You got it, you're adapted up to this with a socket that will fit on that nut. This is your rear end, this is where the drive shaft hooks up. And you're going to check that. Now there's some worksheets for you drive land people where you're going to have to do this. Preload is really high or low can be a cause for a noise condition. I'm reading a five to six inch pounds is equivalent and no preload at all. So above 32 inch pounds, the bearings are likely to overheat and produce noise. That's giving you an idea of why that's got to be perfect. And there is a crush sleeve in there. If you go too far, you can't just back off a little bit. You got to get all that stuff out and put another crush sleeve in it. Okay, so with one hand holding the gear of the end, you tap the threaded end with a soft hammer and you free the pinion, and then you take the pinion out in your hand. See that rear bearing cone in the roller remains pressed on the pinion shaft. So the rear one, that one stays in the rear end. Uh, the other one, this one down here, it's gonna stay with that until you press it off. There's your rear pinion and cone, this is what it looks like. And so that one right there, they don't really have the crush sleeve in there where you can see it good, but, it, but it's right there. There's that little crush sleeve, it ain't very big. All right, see the bearing cups, gears, you know, the crush sleeve actually goes right there between that and the bearing. And there's your companion flange and all that. Then you check the gear set for scoring excessive wear next. Now this you press this off, there's a shim right here that gives you your pinion depth, right? And that's actually, I usually hang on to that one and usually that's the one you'll need. Um, so you remove the ring gear from this room, different location, shake the bolt torque, look for any forward material trapped between the ring gear and the companion flange. If you've got something trapped between here and the ring gear, it might make the gear, you know, wobbly. And cause issues, check the bearing cup for deep scores. You can look at them and tell if they're wore out. You know, they'd be all brindled and everything. Uh, if either the cup and the cone are a little bearing damage, replace the whole bearing. 
And this is a bunch of verbiage right here. You can basically figure all this out, turn it, make sure it operates smoothly. <coughs> Use the ring gear, uh, Loctite on Fred, torque them evenly to the public specification. Torque them really, really good. Any of you see the ones that look like this and have the little castellated look about them? They don't ever have washers under them. Not even if they're holding a water pump pulley on. They never put washers under the castellated bolts like that. I've never seen a washer under one of those. That's pretty interesting there. There's a little co collapsible sleeve. If a new pin is used, be sure to select the proper shim, you know, which is going to go between here and here. And uh, I mean, I, I'm like, I'll tell you, I'll show you more about this when we get out in the shop and do that, you know. Final checks, is the interior of the housing perfectly clean? Are axle shaft seals okay? Are wheel bearings okay? Is drive pinion seal? Are the drive pinion bearings okay? You don't need leaks or anything. You don't want your, if your rear axle bent, it's stopped up, it needs to be unstopped too. Don't get no dirty fingerprints on the fenders of the steering wheel because they don't like that and they'll never bring the car to you again if you leave a mess in their car. And don't play with the radio, okay? Leave, that's not your personal stereo. Turn the radio off if you don't want to hear whether they're playing on the music. Don't listen to the music anyway. You're supposed to be paying attention to what you're doing, unless you're working on the radio. I'm going to show you these tools. I've got these tools. We're going to show you how to hook them up, how to use them, how to put them together, how you're supposed to do that to get your initial pinion depth. You're supposed to measure them between here and all that. And you're going to put it like that. This is something you're going to see on your worksheet. you got a gauge block in there, and i got all those tools. And see that little block right there? You're going to measure between the other gauge block and that one. And you're going to try to determine what the distance is between the tube and there. And that's going to tell you what the shim is supposed to be for your pinion depth, right? And if the pinion has a plus one marking, that's old school stuff. You don't hardly ever see that anymore. Uh, you're going to add one thousandth of an inch to the measured clearance. And for minus one, subtract one, right? All right. Then you put it over here. Here's a collapsible spacer right there. I painted it blue so you can see it. You're going to install your new nut on the pinion shaft. You're always supposed to use a new nut if you can. Uh, if not, put some Loctite on the old nut. But, you know. And this right here is made to hold that flange while you're torquing it. But the thing about it is, you're basically, when you're torquing, you don't torque it to a certain torque reading. You're going to torque it until you start to collapse that spacer and you get rid of all that preload. And then you've got to check and see if how much preload you got on it using that little inch pound torque range, right? And that's what this right here, original bearings 8 to 14, new bearings 17 to 27. That's rule of thumb stuff. Real close, give you an idea what you're supposed to see. Don't ever back off the pinion nut to reduce preload, because you'll have to put a new spacer in there. Don't use an impact wrench to tighten the adjuster nut. Never, never do that. And with pinion depth properly set in the drive pinion install, uh, and so on and so forth, they apply pressure toward the left side to make sure the left bearing cup is seated. And you know, a lot of times they'll say you get some that are a little thinner than what you're going to need, so you can. You know, put a thicker one on one side and a thinner one on the other side. When you get your preload right, you add a four thousandths to each one of them and put one in there that's nice and snug for your preload. Install larger shims on the right side of the largest shim and so on and so forth. Uh, this is something we'll get into a little deeper when we get into the shop. So use the dial indicator with bracketry to measure the ring gear backlash. That's important. And then this is basically a little thing telling you about all them. Rotate it several times to make sure everything's seated properly. Uh, Remeasure the ring gear backlash. Four is going to be eight to fifteen GMs, five to nine. A little bit closer. Establish a differential bearing preload, so on and so forth. That right there is as far as I'm going to go on that because everything else is just basically fluff. And so uh, tell me what you know. Tell me what you know that you didn't know before. Everybody picked up something, right? He, he yawned. What? A bit for love and made me tired. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what do you think? Everybody's just sitting here looking at me like deer in the headlights. Right. Yeah, too much stuff, yeah. Did I overload you? Yes. If I'm going too fast for you, don't worry. It's you all in the video. <laughs> yeah. I, probably you I had to cover a lot of territory in a short period of time, is what it amounted to. But yeah. basically, I exposed you to this, and you can go back through this. Yeah. And whenever we get out there and get the, uh, we get the rear end on the bench, and we basically get the tools, and we talk about it slower, you'll get it better. And you'll see the parts in your hands. You know, looking at pictures somebody drew is not that great and it'll bore you to tears. That's why I don't have long class sessions, you know, dragging out really slow. Have you ever sat under an instructor that talked real slow because they didn't have nothing to say? Yeah. You ever do that? They try to fill up the time so they talk real slow and just try to burn up as much time as good. That drives me crazy. I mean, move fast and all that, and, and when everybody gets it, you know. Now, like I say, I went a little quick, but you can review it because it's going to be on YouTube. And uh, usually I get people on YouTube that are, you know, uh, mechanics and stuff. A lot of times they say, hey man, this is great stuff. You know, and every now and then somebody says, okay, well, you, you got this wrong, you got that wrong, this should have told them this and all that. <laughs> you know, you can't remember to tell everybody everything. But what you will do, is you learn to understand the principles so that you can, you're not just blind when you go into the rear end, you know what you're looking at and you kind of know what you got to do. And that's the point. And uh, 
And you guys need to tighten up. You've been moving a little too slow. Okay? That's right. You got that? <laughs> You're supposed to smile when I say that, all right? All right. I'm going to do my favor. Let's close the doors and go to lunch.